and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that sorta cares about the average consumer, much to the chagrin of most tech snobs. So a while ago I was contacted by a viewer via Facebook, and he asked me if I was familiar with RCA's line of Dynagroove LPs. And, uh, yeah, I've seen many of them over the years. But it got me thinking about all those strange little names and phrases that I've been seeing on records since childhood. Uh, you know, Dynaflex and Quiex and Chex Mix and whatever. So I thought it would be fun to round up as many of these oddly named records as possible, a lot of which were already in my collection, and do an episode on them. So I've got six types of vinyl to go over today, and these were all aimed at the average consumer. Uh, no special gear was required to play these things. And, uh, yeah, make sure you got your good speakers or at least a decent pair of headphones today, because this is going to be one of those sort of episodes. Now we're ready to roll. It has taken many steps and many man hours to get here. Just to clarify, today's topics are all about the vinyl records proper, be it the vinyl stock or how the records were physically cut, all in the name of maximizing the capabilities of the format. In other words, this excludes discs that needed special equipment to play, like DBX or quadraphonic discs or are dependent on the original recording method, like direct-to-disc or 35mm film recordings. Not that I won't cover some of those things on some future undetermined episode. Let's start with the rather unremarkable one. In 1978, CBS slash Columbia, etc., introduced the first LPs cut by the CBS disc computer. In short, the width of a groove on an LP is determined by how much information is occurring at that moment. What the disc computer did was effectively map out ahead of time the necessary width of the grooves, allowing the already variable groove width to become that much more flexible effectively so they could jam more content on the side of an LP with fewer side effects. These discs, to the best of my research, were at least somewhat the norm for CBS and Associates through the end of the 80s. CBS touted that their disc computer cut discs would allow for hotter recording levels even on really long albums, and would cut noise, and would have fewer tracking problems, and would just all around be better. So with that in mind, I've got two confirmed disc computer cut discs, and one of them's actually pertinent to another segment, so I'll save that one. But the other is this one, which is of the first couple Beethoven symphonies, and this particular record dates to 1986. And this thing clocks in at about an hour, and like all my other hour-plus LPs, it's got its noise issues, but I'll give it this much, it's not as bad as those other albums. I think we've all seen the Dolby logo on cassettes a million times. And of course, whether or not you had a Dolby-capable deck really made no major difference on the playback. Dolby was just a filter. So I guess it would logically follow that LPs would have an optional noise reduction system of their own. 
1981, CBS introduced CX-compatible expansion noise reduction. CX was effectively DBX light, whereas the DBX system, with the help of a usually separate piece of gear, would compand the recording levels at a brutal 2 to 1 to 2 ratio, CX took a much gentler approach, maybe about a third of DBX. The idea was that you could have either a standalone CX unit or a CX-equipped turntable to max out the quality of a CX-encoded LP, or you could just listen without any special gear for a somewhat compressed version of your album. The first CX discs dropped in 1981 right alongside their standard counterparts at the same price. Add to that a total public indifference and ignorance to the technology, and not to mention protests from audio engineers and some artists, and, well, I'd be willing to bet that most of the CX-encoded discs in existence were purchased by folks that were oblivious to the technology. Depending on your source, there were only between 100 and 200 CX-encoded LPs released. CX LPs were discontinued in 1983, but the technology was adapted into home video via the CED and, most famously, the Laserdisc, the latter lasting into the early 2000s. I only own two CX encoded LPs, and I don't have a decoder, nor do I have any non-encoded copies of these albums to compare against. Really, my only proper experience with CX is by way of CEDs and laser discs, and honestly, I'll be damned if I can tell the difference with or without it, at least on a laser disc. But um, if you really want to hear more about CX LPs, the Techmone channel here on YouTube has a full video on them, and he actually has a decoder, so. Go check that out, you'll learn a lot more than you will in a little three-minute segment here. But anyway, as I mentioned, I have two CX-encoded LPs, and this first one has some sort of funky white buildup in the grooves, so I'm guessing that someone had one of those cute little vinyl cleaning kits that does more harm than good, because uh, this thing, it sounds about as good as it looks. Now, this other album also happens to be my other disc computer cut disc, and it's this Lacey J. Dalton album, and this fares far, far better. But having said that, I think I would probably still prefer a non-encoded copy, because I think this is just one of those things you pick up if you've been listening to vinyl for years. But to my ears, it's like a less extreme version of a DBX encoded LP, minus the processing. So go hit up my DBX episode if you need samples. But I do hear some compression going on in here, and like I said, it's one of those things that you're probably only going to pick up if you've been listening for a long time. Otherwise, you probably won't notice any difference, and it'll be pretty much interchangeable with any other regular LP. So despite my lack of a decoder, here are a couple of samples.
If you've spent enough time digging through used record bins, I guarantee you've seen the Dynagroove name at some point, and probably thought nothing of it. Introduced in 1963, Dynagroove was RCA's stab at making their records sound better on standard consumer-grade gear. Consumer-grade turntables prior to about 1965 used especially heavy spherical styli, not to mention that cheaper audio systems of the time often had a not-so-accurate frequency response. As such, RCA developed a computer system of sorts that would, amongst many other things that I won't go into here, cut records with less bass and more mid and upper range, along with some minor compression on heavy vinyl stock, to withstand those heavy, harsh needles. To add insult to injury, RCA began favoring recording and mixing methods in their studios that would adhere better to the needs of the Dynagroove system. Sorry, tape geeks. As you could imagine, this didn't go over well with hi-fi geeks, whose systems could usually accurately reproduce whatever was thrown at them. Nonetheless, RCA plowed ahead with the Dynagroove system, albeit continuing to tinker with the frequency response. Oh yeah, and dropping those recording studio requirements. The last Dynagroove LPs rolled off the line in either 1968 or 69. To make matters confusing, some of RCA's LPs of this period are labeled as Dynagroove, but they're actually not. Uh, pretty much the only guaranteed Dynagroove albums you're going to find are from the 1963 to 65 range. But given how plentiful these things are, I decided to conduct a little experiment, and I decided to just go out thrifting and pick out a handful of Dynagroove albums, ranging from 63 to 68, and really, the only one with any kind of significant low end is the last, most recent one. But all of these, whether or not they're genuine Dynagroove or not, uh, they sound a bit unnatural to me. Uh, they seem to have quite a bit of mid-range to them. But because it may not be apparent at first, what I'm going to do here is, in addition to my couple of Dynagroove clips, I'm also going to throw in a clip from an unrelated album that's a uh, full frequency disc, uh, which actually only tops out at about 14k. And this is from 1960, so a few years ahead of Dynagroove. And, spoiler alert, I think you're going to find that that full frequency disc sounds just a little more realistic than any of the Dynagrooves. <laughs> Sunny. Thank you for the sunshine bouquet Sunny Thank you for the love you brought my way My life was torn like windblown sand Then a rock was formed when we held hands Sunny one so true I love you Sunny The record compound, the finest pure vinyl obtainable, is fed into the press in granular form.
1969, RCA came up with a vinyl formulation designed to allow the use of pure vinyl stock on standard issue LPs, but also to cut costs. The idea was that, at the time, it had become the norm to start adding bits of recycled vinyl and record labels and the associated glue to the vinyl mix, causing noisier pressings. In response, RCA wanted to go back to pure vinyl stock, but do so without raising their own bottom line, so RCA simply made lighter LPs, i.e. Dynaflex. These discs have a way of resembling a Salvador Dali painting. Most American pressings of RCA albums from about 1970 to 74 were on Dynaflex. However, starting around 1974, things get a bit confusing. RCA left the Dynaflex name on the LP labels, but started to go back to the old vinyl stock, meaning that some standard, heavier LPs still bore the Dynaflex name. Conversely, some Dynaflex discs are not labeled as such. It all boils down to how floppy the LP is. Depending on your source, the last Dynaflex discs rolled off the line anywhere between 1976 and 80. My money says closer to 76. I have something of a love-hate relationship with Dynaflex. I've owned at least 20 Dynaflex albums over the years, and I'll tell you right now, they only ever seem to sound as good as how little wear they have. And I think that's due to the lighter vinyl stock. I think it makes it a little more prone to just the everyday wear and tear from general use. But also, my thing about Dynaflex is that these albums warp pretty easily. In fact, at least half of my Dynaflexes, these are just a few, uh, they all have some degree of warpage, and it hasn't gotten any better over the years. But if you can find yourself a gently used, uh, preferably not warped or only lightly warped Dynaflex LP, they can sound pretty good. I would just probably avoid new old stock because they're probably pretty badly warped just from the pressure of the shrink wrap. Life was only easy when two were divided But one has decided to bring down the curtain And one thing for certain there's nothing to keep them together In the early days of audiophile, quote-unquote, virgin vinyl, we're talking circa 1973, the stock was intended to be as pure as possible, so much so that it was actually translucent. Black dye would be added so it would resemble a standard LP. The Quiex, Quiex 2, and Quiex SV systems fall into this so-called virgin category, for what it's worth, I'm guessing the name changes were intended to reflect changes in the vinyl stock formula, no matter how minor. 
Anyway, Quiex discs were introduced in the early 80s and phased out within a few years. Quiex stock was mostly used on promo pressings of pop and rock albums, but also used for a while by A&M Records for their standard LPs. In more recent years, the now Quiex SV formula has landed in the hands of Kansas-based quality record pressings who is using it for audiophile reissues. The a and LPs that used the Quiex vinyl were part of the Audio Master Plus series, and uh, I'll show you that logo a little closer during the clips. But uh, just a little trivia, they used that name on some of their cassettes and CDs into the 90s. It's just only the vinyl has any relation to Quiex. But as for the records themselves, they were mastered at half speed and really done the same way all the big audiophile releases of the time were done, but they were priced a little more in line with a standard LP. And they sound right on par with those albums, so if you can find one of these, pick it up. Now, as for the promo pressings, as far as I know, these were just simply pressed on Quiex. They weren't mastered or pressed in any special way. And despite that, they're still some of my best sounding 80s albums. Today's last vinyl type is one that I've sorta of touched on before, JVC Super Vinyl. JVC developed Super Vinyl around 1973 as a means of working with the compatible Discrete 4 or CD4 system, read quadraphonic vinyl that could also be played back on a standard turntable without major issue. The idea was that the vinyl stock needed to be as resilient as possible to meet the demands of the CD4 format. Like the Quiex formula, Super Vinyl was made from a so-called virgin vinyl stock, which apparently contained products that, depending on who you listen to, were toxic and or damaging to the environment and or contained animal byproduct, like whale oil. Either way, it was evidently illegal to manufacture super vinyl in the U.S., so JVC, Japanese Victor Company, did it exclusively. Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs, Nautilus, and of course the regular Japanese market adapted the use of super vinyl, but had to have all the pressings done in Japan, of course. Sometime in the 80s, JVC discontinued Super Vinyl, and allegedly, despite offers to buy the formula, everything revolving around Super Vinyl was destroyed and thrown out. Of course, the other big selling point of Super Vinyl, here in the US at least, would be that the albums would be made specifically for the audiophile market. And these albums would be mastered specifically for vinyl at half speed, and this meant having to re-EQ the album so it wouldn't sound off when played at normal speed, and this meant a lot of trial and error involved for the people that had to do the mastering, and it could result in brighter sounding than usual vinyl, but usually they'd work those bugs out while they were still working on them. Now, as for the four super vinyl albums I own uh, that aren't DBX encoded, uh, they're all Mobile Fidelities and Nautiluses. 
And in my experience, they're all pretty quiet LPs uh, in terms of noise, and they have a real good tonal balance by vinyl standards. And really the only problem I've ever encountered is if it wasn't too well taken care of by the original owner. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I cause a big scandal by listening to streaming music. Because I'm a real badass that way. Thank you for the green.